Are house church Christians guilty of violating Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25? Now, if you worship at home, you're eventually going to run into some kind of a church building pastor, and he's going to tell you that if you're not part of a quote-unquote local church or local fellowship, that you are forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. Okay? And he will refer you to the book of Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. That's where they'll go. It's happened to me numerous times. I get the thing put on me all the time. Well, you're forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm going to show you today that that scripture perversion is actually one of the very worst out there. I'm going to show you that Hebrews 10.25 has nothing to do with a Christian in the church age right now. You need to actually look at this thing and look at it in its context. Okay. Now, when studying a, a subject, it's often good to look at it in two different ways. First of all, what does it not say, what's not true about it, and what does it actually say? Okay. When you approach a scripture, you have to look at the context in which it appears. So we're going to look today at the context of Hebrews 10.25. We're going to see what it does not say, and then I'm going to show you what the context of it actually is trying to say. Who is it pointed to? Okay, That's going to be very important in this study. So turn in your Bible, your King James Bible, to Hebrews 10.25. We'll show you here. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. It says here, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Okay? Now, let's make a few points here of this, this thing being used against house church Christians, people that don't worship in a building. They'll say, You've guilty, you're guilty of, of not following Hebrews 10.25. Let's ask a couple questions. First of all, the term local church, does it appear in that verse? No, it does not. Local fellowship, no. Uh, independent fundamental Baptist church, no. Uh, First Baptist church of wherever, no. It doesn't appear. Number two, the verse says ourselves, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves. That's talking about saved people. Now, the modern day church building, is it just saved people that go there? No. You're actually encouraged to bring lost people with you to the saved building there, assembly. So, again, they're violating that verse. If they want to use it, they're already violating the verse. It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. They're violating that when they invite the lost in. And by the way, you don't have to go to too many of these church buildings to see that all the people there are not saved. Even the regular attendees, many times, are lost. So Hebrews 10.25, they're violating it with their building that's open to the public. Question number three. Where in that verse does it imply a weekly meeting? When it says that you're not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together, ourselves together there, does it say... On a weekly basis? No. It doesn't say it. And fourth, where is there a building required in that verse? Okay. Is this illegal here, what we're doing? Us meeting out in the woods like this, if we have a group of Christians, you know, meeting out here, and I can guarantee you, if you do that, and I'm going to talk about that this as we continue in the study, if you would meet in a place like this or in a home or a living room, you're not considered to be legitimate. And they'll still put that thing on you. You're forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. But where in Hebrews 10.25, where in that verse does it say anything about meeting in a building that's called a church with a steeple on top? Where does it say it? It doesn't. So, by them quoting that verse, they're actually proving that they are not in line with that scripture. They are actually the ones that are guilty of violating Hebrews 10.25. But let's look at verse 26 through 31. You say, you know, what's the context? Let's look at it. 
Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 through 31 says, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden under foot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace? For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will re recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hmm. Now you know the interesting thing? Most dispensational pastors will tell you that Hebrews 10, 26, there in 27 especially, actually 10, 26 through 20, or through 31, but 26 and 27 in specifically, most dispensational King James Bible-believing pastors will tell you that that is aimed at a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble. You know, that's why the book is called Hebrews. But wait a second. If you can use verse 25 to attack the brethren that don't go to a building, why is it that you don't continue and use 26 and 27? And by the way, notice there the very first word in verse 26, it's for. You know what that means? That means it's tying verse 26 to verse 25. So you can't separate the two. You can't say, well, instruction in righteousness, verse 25, verse 26 and 27 is doctrine for the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh-uh, uh-uh. It's tied together for if we sin willfully. Okay? It's right there. Why would you rip a verse out of its context to prove something that's not even scriptural? Unless you have an agenda. You know, 1 Timothy 6, verse 10. You know? Look it up if you don't know what that is. Now, let me ask you a question. Did Paul fellowship weekly with other Christians? Oh, of course he did. I mean, he attended a Baptist church, an independent fundamental Baptist church, and I mean, he had a suit and tie on every week, and, and he was there, and they went out for visitation and things, and they had the Wednesday night Bible study and Sunday school and uh, VBS and all this other stuff. Of course Paul did, because we know that Paul would have been a good Baptist. You know, I believe in Baptist doctrine, not Bible doctrine. You know, right? Hmm. Let's look about that. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. We're going to see what Paul practiced. And I know where some of you are already thinking on this thing. I know what you're going to say. And I'm going to be answering that. So stay tuned. Don't shut the video off and then write a comment, some stupid comment that I don't know what I'm talking about or whatever because you've seen the first five minutes of the sermon and now you're, you're done because you're convinced that Brian Dellinger is a heretic. You know... That's why I set my comments to approval only to get rid of some of the nonsense. And people put in there, watch this video, and they put the link and stuff in their comments. You know, I made a video on why I set my comments to approval only, so watch that if you have questions. Galatians chapter 1, verse 13. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Was that a building or the people? It was the people. It was not the church of God is not an assembly of God or something like this. You know, it's no, it's, you know, the assembly of God denomination I'm talking about. The church of God is a reference to the people, not a building. Continuing on here, verse 14. And profited in the Jews religion above many my equals in mine own nation being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I went up to Jerusalem and joined the first Baptist church and became a faithful member. Oh wait, I didn't read that right. It says immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Hmm. Paul doesn't sound like he was a very good Christian then. He must have been forsaking the assembling of himself with the other believers. Continuing, verse 17. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years, 
I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, and abode with him fifteen days. But other, but other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Sorry to you Catholics out there, Jesus had brothers and sisters. Verse 20, Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in time past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. Hmm. Doesn't sound like Paul was a very active member of a local church. Notice a couple things here. Number one, Paul persecuted the church and not a building. We already talked about that. Number two, after Paul got saved, he did not go to fellowship with the brethren in Jerusalem. Now, wouldn't you think that a man that was an apostle would want to go up immediately and confer with those guys? But he didn't. Hmm. It was three years before he even contacted Peter. Three years. Oh, well, he must have been fellowshipping in a local church there to be taught and things like that. Uh, well, or he could have been taught by the Holy Spirit. You know, I know that a lot of the brethren out there don't believe in the Holy Spirit, apparently, in practice. They might in word, but in practice they don't, because they kind of believe this thing. If somebody gets saved and they're not part of a local church, then they'll somehow get, get messed up. It never amount to anything. And you say, you don't think that ever happens? Oh, no. I think it happens somewhat, but uh, let me ask you the painful question that you don't really want to consider. Do people get saved and go to a church building? Do they get saved and go there and get messed up? Mm -hmm. See, you want to say that somebody, you have to go to some kind of a building someplace, that way you won't get messed up, but then you don't want to consider the flip side of that and say, what if you go to the building, you might get messed up. See, that's something that they don't want to think about. And I've posed this question many times to these church building advocates, and I've said to them, has God used church buildings? And they'll say, oh yes, of course God has used church buildings. Has Satan used church buildings? Ooh, don't want to think about that one. Because if you look at it, you go down through a town or a city or whatever, and those buildings that have the steeples on top and whatever, I don't care what denomination, anything called a church, most of those churches are damning people to hell. Most of them. Most of the church buildings that have ever existed have sent people to hell, not to heaven. People come in and they're members in good standing and they think that that's going to take them to heaven. And it doesn't. It takes them to hell. Satan is the one who's used church buildings more than God has. I'll grant you, I'm not going to be so narrow-minded that I'm going to say God has never, ever saved anybody that walked into one of these buildings that they call a church. I'm not going to say that. Okay? I can't prove that. But what I am saying is more people have gone to hell as a result of those buildings than have gone to heaven. And for this stinking papal mentality of these guys, these pastors, these hirelings in these buildings... To put this thing down on you that, and put people down that are not going to some building someplace and to say, you're forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. You're ridiculous. Paul did that. Paul did not go to a building someplace. He didn't even fellowship with the brethren for three years. Three years. It's ridiculous. Okay. And another interesting thing there in that passage, Galatians 1, 13 through 24, Paul remained unknown by face to most of the Christians at that time, but his works were known. Hmm. So you say, what was Paul doing in those three years when he didn't go up to the brethren, brethren in Jerusalem there? What did he do? He was out preaching. You know, that's a good way to learn the Bible, to, to go out and be an active ministry for the Lord. And how many times do people get saved and they want to go and they want to serve the Lord and they want to pass out tracts and they want to do all this stuff and they go to some stinking dead building and they get in there and it's like, can we go pass out tracts? Well, we would this weekend, but somebody has to volunteer to mow the lawn and somebody has to volunteer to vacuum the floors and somebody has to, we got to have the, the nursery painted after all. I mean, we got to have it looking attractive, you know. I mean, you can't expect people to come in here and put their babies into an unattractive nursery. Hey, 
I've been there. I used to go to a, a big Baptist church someplace here locally, and I used to go there, and it was just like, oh, well, we can't go out soul winning this weekend because we got this stuff to work on here, and we got to reorganize this and that and everything. Uh-huh. Paul was known because he was going out and doing work for the Lord. His labor was known for the Lord because he wasn't tied up with some dead building someplace. But look at Galatians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. But I'm sure after Paul, you know, you know, when he went up there to Jerusalem, then he was in regular weekly fellowship, right? Verse 1, chapter 2. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. Huh. Boy, Paul, you know. And it's funny because you, you look at a lot of these, a lot of the brethren, you know, they, the Baptists especially, they have things in their church constitution, you know, where's that at in Scripture? But they have things in their, in their rules that if you get out of fellowship for like even like a half a year or something or a year, you're automatically a non-member. Well, boy, I guess Paul would have been a non-member of the church back then, wouldn't he? Because it was 14 years again before he came up to Jerusalem. Boy, Paul, I, I don't know about Paul. But what was the point in him coming up to Jerusalem again? It was so that he could present the gospel that he's preaching to the Gentiles and those that were of reputation, the other apostles and the men that were saved. Paul told them, this is the gospel that I'm preaching. What do you think? And they discussed it and they, and they talked it over among themselves. It wasn't so he could go and fellowship with the brethren and talk about things of the world like what goes on in most church buildings. Mm -hmm. What's the average conversation before and after service in the church buildings? Hey, I've been around. I was raised in church buildings. You know, Don't tell me I don't know what I'm talking about. If you've been to church buildings, you know what I'm talking about. They talk about sports. They'll talk about movies. They'll talk about the new cars that are coming out or whatever, hot rods and whatnot. They'll talk about hunting. They'll talk about fishing. They'll talk about politics. Very rarely are you going to have Christians standing around before and after service talking about the Bible. Very rarely. Very rarely are you going to go to some church building somewhere and you're going to hear them talking about planning to go out and evangelize the lost. Most of the time they don't waste their time on it. Hmm. A little different there. But, you know... Here's where the brethren come in and they'll say, but Paul was the exception to the rule. You know, Paul was there and God was supernaturally revealing things to him. It wasn't quite the same as a Christian today. You know, what makes you think that uh, we should follow Paul's example? Well, 1 Corinthians 4.16 says, Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1 says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Philippians 3.17 says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an ensample. Hmm. So three different places Paul tells the Christian, follow me. Paul says, follow my example. Follow what I'm doing here. Hmm. You know something that's funny? That I myself have experienced, and I know my wife has experienced, and I know a lot of people have experienced you get away from these church buildings, you get away from that whole thing, and you actually study the Word of God on your own. And we have tremendous resources nowadays with the Internet. You can listen to sermons. You can listen to get the Alexander Scorby recordings, which I always talk about. Listen to the King James Bible while you're doing your work or going around doing whatever. Listen to the Bible, and you can learn so much when you are disconnected from a church building. And how many times have I gotten emails? I don't even know. I lost count. People email me. People send me letters. And they say, I've gone to church 30, 40, 50 years. And I never learned what I've learned from you in one month. A couple weeks. You know, I'll get people and they'll say, you know, I remember the one the one time that made me laugh. It was, it was funny. I, not because I'm making fun, but just I, I liked it. They said that they just discovered my, my channel on YouTube. And they said that they've listened to like, 38 sermons of mine or something in two days. <laughs> you know, that's wonderful. What are they doing? They're learning. They're studying. 
apart from a official sanctioned church building. Whew. Kind of like what Paul did. And you know one of the best places to learn something is on the battlefield. When you go out there and you actually start to pass out tracts or you start to witness to your lost friends and relatives and stuff and they'll bring up questions and you have to go back and you have to study it in the Bible. You have to look up the answers to those questions. And by the way, if somebody ever gives you a question that you can't answer, don't say, oh, I, you know, uh, 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 don't let it shake your faith. You just simply say, well, I don't know that right now. That's a good question. I can get you the answer. You know? See, the, the thing about the loss that you have to understand is you might, they might throw 20 questions at you and you answer 19 of them. If you can't answer one question, they'll say that they've won. <laughs> you know, they expect you to have all the answers. Uh, Christian, you're not going to have all the answers. You know why? The just shall live by faith. You're not going to live by sight. You're not going to have all the answers for everybody. You're going to have to, faith is going to have to come in there at some point in time. Now, I'll grant you, you can get the answers to most questions, but the Lord's never going to give you total sight in this life. You're going to have to live by faith. But I'll tell you right now, you will learn a lot of things if you depart from the organized church building. Because, see, the organized church building has a program that they have to follow, and of course, if they see any visitors, well, then the, the sermon that might have been there to feed you as a Christian, which you need, that sermon now has to be shifted to a salvation message. See, because after all, that's the purpose of the building, to bring in the lost, to get them saved, to make them active members so that you can get their money. Oh, did I say that? I guess so. Um, but let's continue here. What were the fellowshipping practices of other believers? Okay, We see that Paul was a dirty reprobate that was uh, forsaking the assembling of himself with the other brethren. What about other believers back then? Acts chapter 12. Go back in your Bible to Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12, verse 12 through 19. Okay, it says here, And when he had considered the thing, this is Peter, he was in jail. You know, um, Herod there was going to deliver him after Easter, you know, because Herod was a pagan. That's why he celebrated Easter, not the Passover. King James has the right translation there, not the new versions. But uh, Peter's in prison. The Lord busts him out of prison. Verse 12, And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying in a house. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, It is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Now as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what was become of Peter. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded them, or commanded that they should be put to death, and he went down from Judea to Caesarea, and there abode in a local church. Now it doesn't say that. It says there abode. Hmm. But I'm sure Peter, you know, he made it there to uh, Judea. To, he went from Judea to Caesarea. You know, I'm sure he got there in time for the weekly service, right? Where's this stuff at? Acts chapter 20. Turn to Acts chapter 20. And there's a lot more examples we could go through today too, but I'm, you know, for sake of time, I'm trying to keep this thing short. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Let me just stop there. A lot of the brethren are trying to say that, you know, the Seventh-day Adventist cult, they try to get people back to the Sabbath day and all that which is funny because they, they say you have to worship on the Sabbath day, but if you break the Sabbath day, they won't put you to death, even though that's what the Bible required in the Old Testament. You know, you don't have to keep the Sabbath day. You know, now I understand that there are some issues with the Sunday thing. You know, there's some Catholic implications there, and I understand that. But the fact of the matter is, 
they met here in Acts chapter 20 on the first day of the week. Now, does it say that it was a required thing to meet every week on Sunday from 9 to 12? No, you aren't going to find that in Scripture. That's not there. But to say that you shouldn't meet on a Sunday, you can't prove that either. See, the Lord designed the church to be flexible. I've talked about that before. Why? Because there's persecution that comes on true believers. So true believers have to be able to meet on different days, at different times, at night, in the morning, in the afternoon, in the woods, in the, in the fields, in a cave, in a house. The church has to be flexible. It cannot be a rigid building that you have to go to. You must attend on a weekly basis and you go from 9 to 12 Sunday morning, 6 to 7 Sunday evening, 7 to 8 uh, Wednesday evening. You aren't going to find that in Scripture. And what irritates me is when these people are propping up this phony system that has no basis in Scripture and then they, they tell you that you're sinning if you're not part of their phony system. That's what I'm irritated about. You know, a brother or sister that wants to go to the whole thing there and they're part of it and all that, whatever, you know. But what I get irritated about is when people try to clamp that thing down on me and on other brethren out there that choose not to be part of these buildings. But continuing here, verse 8, And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together, and there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell on him, and embracing him said, Trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. When he therefore was come up again, and had broken bread, and eaten, and talked a long while, even till break of day, so he departed. And they brought the young man alive, and, and were not a little comforted. Does that resemble a modern day church building service? You know what's funny about the modern day church building? And I've had this thing put on me because I've spoken in modern day church buildings. You can see it on my website or on my channel here. You can see me speaking in church buildings. You know, I'm going to talk about that particular church building here in just a few minutes. But you know what's put on you when you go to one of those places? The pastor usually will come up to you and he'll say, Now, uh, try to keep it about half hour, 45 minutes. Okay? Don't, don't go over that because I don't want to irritate the people. You know, we have schedules and stuff and we got to go home for Sunday dinner and, and we got things to do and stuff. We're going to go fishing this afternoon, go for a walk and blah, blah, blah. If you dared to go to one of these modern church buildings and preach all day through the night until the break of dawn, you would have people mad at you. They'd say, that's not the official order of service. We're from 9 to 12. How dare you go past that? Again, is the modern church building of God? No, I'm sorry, but it's not. And it's going to become more and more apparent, brethren. You know, read your Bible, Revelation chapter 13. The false prophet causes the whole world to worship the beast. Where do you worship at? Church buildings. And they're worshiping the image of the beast. And most church buildings now have giant screens and they project things up onto it. It's right there. The Antichrist system is coming in. It's amazing. You know, and they're already, the persecution is already starting. Now it's just in word right now. All right, it's not in deed, not yet. But in word, they're already persecuting believers like me, believers like a lot of you out there because you aren't part of this building system. Oh, you don't, you know, where do you worship at? I don't. I worship at home. I, you know, meet with some of the other brethren and stuff. I worship online. You know, there's guys I listen to. Oh, well, you're forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. Oh, yeah, uh-huh. Sure. I guess I should be part of a building and take a mark too, right? But now let's look at Acts chapter 20, verse 17. And we're going to read down through to, to verse 38. Again, we're going to see Paul meeting with some of the brethren. Now compare this to a modern day church building service. Verse 17. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I have showed you and have taught you publicly and from church building to church building. 
Oh no, I'm sorry, it says house to house. And also he taught publicly, not tucked away in his little IFB church building. Hmm. And I know, you know, again, there are some brethren out there that do teach publicly. They go out and they preach on the street. You know, but you and I both know a lot of them don't. Verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm not going to go off on that again. Uh, verse 22, and now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Again, let me just stop for a minute. Modern day church buildings, they cannot declare unto you all the counsel of God. They can't do it. They have to have special times and special classes and all this other stuff. You know, the average church building, they have to have sermons for the lost. They see lost people come in, you have to preach to them. You have to try and get them saved. And how are you going to preach real sound Bible doctrine when you have a half hour or 45 minutes to preach? You aren't going to have time to do it. Don't give me this line of nonsense. Oh, well, we can teach just as much strong doctrine in a church building as you can online. Nonsense. That is nonsense. Absolute, total nonsense. No, you can't. I've gone to church buildings, okay? And there have been times, I remember back as a kid, I'd get some guy, I remember being a real little boy in Sunday school at the church building I went to growing up, Calvary Monument Bible Church, it was called, which is just now wicked and apostate of course. And I remember they had a creation science guy come in and he was talking to us about creation science. And I was, I was so excited about the thing. But see, in a half hour, his time was up. So it didn't matter that I had more questions. No, the schedule must continue here. Hey man, half hour, you got a half hour. Don't you dare go over it. Because if you go over it, you're going to mess up the rest of our service. And our pageant is not going to be able to go on. Don't tell me that you can preach the Word of God and teach the Word of God and declare unto the people all the counsel of God in a half-hour Sunday school, half-hour, 45-minute church service, and in an hour or half-hour or something at night. You cannot. You cannot do it. It's impossible. And that's why a lot of people that go to these church buildings for 30 or 40, 50 years, they don't learn anything but how to warm a pew how to stand up and sing a song when it's their time and how to put money in the plate as it's going by. That's what they learn how to do. That's why all these sheep are so weak and anemic. And you go to some of these church buildings and there's sheep just coming and going all the time. Why? Because they say, I'm not being fed. But the show must go on. Verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Okay? Paul giving instruction to the elders there and he's saying, you better take heed. You need to feed the church of God. Do you think those people that met with Paul back here in verses 7 through 12, do you think those people were fed that night? Hearing the Apostle Paul, hearing his stories, hearing how he was beaten, hearing how all this stuff... Do you think they were fed almost 24 hours of his preaching? Boy, wouldn't you have liked to have been part of that service? <laughs> wow, that would have been something else. Continuing, verse 29. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease night, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Huh. Night and day? That sounds like more than 9 to 12 Sunday morning. You know. Verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. 
ye, or yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, there it is again, how that so laboring ye ought to supply or to support the weak, and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had thus spoken, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they all wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him unto the ship. Hmm. Very interesting stuff there. You know, again, Paul is telling them, there's a very extreme importance here for you to preach the word of these people and teach them the Bible. Why? Because grievous wolves are going to come in. And I don't have this scripture written down here, but you know Jesus Christ rebuked the hirelings in John chapter 10? Why did he rebuke them? Because when the wolf comes, the hireling flees because he has no real love for the sheep. And the sheep are scattered. And you know what these cowardly, stinking pastors do? They'll blame the sheep. The hireling will blame the sheep for falling away. They'll say, oh, well, they're, you know, brother so-and-so and sister so-and-so, they're not in fellowship anymore. They're forsaking the assembling of themselves together. You know, they'll do that. They'll put it on the sheep. Why? Because some false prophet came along and got that sheep messed up somewhere because the pastor didn't take the time to teach him the word of God. Hmm. You know, because you only have, you know, Sunday morning, Sunday evening, Wednesday evening. How ridiculous. You know, it's interesting. Proverbs chapter 20, 21, verse 16 is a very interesting verse. It says, The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. You know, there are a lot of dead congregations out there. You know? I mean, this church I used to go to this one there was a liberty baptist church back in its glory days it used to have jack hiles coming to it you know and uh, jerry falwell came and visited and preached there and all this stuff and then they went through you know split after split after split and now you have this million dollar property and i'm not kidding it was a million dollar property which still wasn't paid off is in debt you know and it's 501c3 so they can't sell the property they're stuck on there you know and because it's the government that owns the property another story but here they had this, this big, huge, dead building and like 30 people in regular attendance. And it used to have 900 people. And you got this gigantic auditorium, basically. And you have some people here and some people over there. You know, you wave to them, hey. <laughs> you know, what is it? Congregation of the dead. Mm -hmm. And how many of these big, huge church buildings from the past... Uh, that were great edifices of truth and, you know, whatever else. And now they're not even church buildings anymore. You can't even find them. Why? Well, if this work or this council be of men, it'll come to naught. And a lot of those big buildings were cults of personality. They worshipped and sir, they worshipped the pastor up there because he could put on a good show. And when the pastor died out, the people kind of faded into the background. They came for the show. See? Oh, but that doesn't go on anymore today, right? Yeah. Sure. And it's interesting here. We'll go next to Titus, or I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 4. You know, it's just interesting to see people, you know, try to make it that, uh, oh boy, times sure have changed from the way things were done back there in the Bible. Well, not really. Uh, the Lord does not expect, you know, well, they didn't have church buildings back there in the first century because they just didn't have time or money to build them. But, you know, we, we do now because we're advanced somehow. No, I don't think the Lord's behind the church building movement. And that's going to become more apparent as time goes by in this country, especially in America. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. Let's see about Paul being in fellowship here. Okay, he tells the believers there, you're not going to see me anymore. The Holy Spirit's saying that if I go down to Jerusalem, I'm going to be taken and put in bonds and everything. And it says here, verse 9 through 11, 
Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Crescens to, Gal to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. Wait a second here. Paul was only in fellowship with one other believer? Oh boy, that doesn't sound too good, does it? Oh man, I mean, th this is bad news here. I mean, Paul must have been really forsaking the assembling of himself with other believers. I mean, that's, that's bad. Only Luke is with me. Now, this uh, hireling that I have on my channel here, Bruce Ireland is his name. Kind of Ireland sounds like hireling. Um, we were going up to this building there. I went up there to help out with a lot of different things. I have been kind of quiet about what happened there simply because I was waiting on the Lord, waiting on the timing just to see, you know, how much should I say here, you know, whatever. Uh, is there bitterness up there, you know, if, if there was a forgiving spirit and whatever else, I'd have just let the thing go. But the point is I need to talk about this thing now. I'm going to talk about some of the details of why we left up there uh, simply because I want to warn other brethren that might be in the same situation. And this hireling up there, he had his church building someplace there up in uh, McKean County, Eldred, the city of Eldred. And, you know, they called my wife and I to come up there. And later on, we realized it was because of our abilities with working with computers, mine with working with video and photography. We built two websites for them, did a whole bunch of work. It was just a constant strain on our marriage having to, you know, work for these people. And they, in exchange, they let us stay in this old rundown house that had a lot of problems, you know. And, okay, fine, whatever. But, see, when I came there, I asked this hireling, I said, <clears throat> I said, uh, now, this house, nobody's lived there for three years, right? Yes, that's correct. I said, the guy that owns it, you know, is he all of a sudden going to show up and kick us out? You know? Oh, no, 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 no. No, you know, that, that's not going to happen. I said, okay, you have three different three children that are all married and have families and stuff. Are they going to come and want to live in this place? No, no, nope. So we were told that we could live in this house. And I said, I don't want to move all of our stuff up here and then have to move again in another year or less than a year, which is what turned out to happen. But that's what we were told. That's why I left our house church and went up to help out with this thing. I'm newly married. I want to have a place where my wife and I can go and, and start a new life, you know, and have our own place and, and everything else. That's what we wanted. Okay? So we pack up all of our things. And this cost thousands of dollars to do this, which I don't have a lot of money. So that was a that was a big expense. We go up there. There was all kinds of stuff going wrong with that place all the time. And we're there. December rolls around and he tells us, we are stepping down and you can have the house. See, because it was given into their care. So he says, you can have the house. It's yours. You can have it. A couple months later, he tells me his daughter and her husband and their boys, they're actually going to come and buy the house. And you're going to have to find another place to live. And I'm like, oh, wait a second here. This isn't what we were told. Yeah, we're real sorry about that. I, I admit I kind of lied to you, you know. But we're real sorry about that. Sorry, you're going to have to find a place. And by this time, I was back into the, seeing all the politics of the church building again that I had forgotten about because I was away from it for years and years and years. And it's like, I thought, well, maybe this time it's going to work because he believes, he believes the King James Bible. Okay, I'll say that for him. I never heard him correct the King James Bible from the pulpit. So good for you, you know, whatever. But the fact is, we were lied to. We were taken up there. We moved up there, we were lied to, and we got to a point where it was just like, okay, we were both going, I'm so fed up and sick and tired of this building service thing all the time, and just, you know, ridiculous politics and everything that goes on in these church buildings. You know what I'm talking about if you've left them, you know? And it was finally just like, you know, you get this burden on you. It's like this this dead carcass that you're dragging with you, with a, like a chain, you know, and you're dragging it along. And it's just like, I just want to be free from this thing. I want to worship the Lord when I feel like worshiping the Lord. I don't want to come and be part of the pageant on a weekly basis. I just want to go and serve Jesus Christ with my life and not have this 
pastoral oversight over top of me that says, I don't want you to preach this and I don't want you to preach that. And it turned into this big argument the one time, you know, we were called on the carpet, you know, because that's what you have to do to heretics like my wife and I. And we were called on the carpet and we were told, he said, my ministry is not a legitimate New Testament ministry. Preaching to people online, that's not legitimate. And I'm thinking, didn't Paul write letters to people? Huh. I guess Paul wasn't legitimate either. And he said that uh, we need to be part of a, a local church. And I need, need to be under a pastor. And I said, well, every pastor I've ever been under is a coward. And he said, am I a coward? I said, well, you told me not to speak against the Catholics. The one time I was going to preach, one of my a prophecy seminar I was doing, I was told I'm, not, I'm to take it easy on the Catholics. And boy, I said that. I said, you told me not to preach against the Catholics. And his face, you know, his countenance changed. And he yelled at me, this is my church, and this is my pulpit, and I say what's preached here. And I thought, whoa boy. And then he proceeded to tell me how, and before he, would say, he had said that the church, of course I understand that the church is the believers, not the building. But then he proceeds to tell me, you know, after this big blow up, he, he proceeded to tell me about a brother in the area that had put up a sign attacking the Catholics and his building was shut down and he lost his church. And I thought to myself, wait a second here. I thought you said the church was the people, not the building. But this guy, because he preached the truth, had lost his building. Doesn't make sense. But this hireling went on to tell us that if we go, and it's just my wife and I, putting out sermons and stuff and fellowshipping and we meet other believers, you know, and we'll talk to them and things. That's not legitimate. And I said, okay, what would it take for me to be legitimate? He said, you need at least one or two other people. And I said to myself, I said, so let me get this straight. I, you know, I actually said this to him. I said, let me get this straight. We're not legitimate as a local church, you know, a local fellowship. We're not legitimate if it's just two of us. But if we have three, we're legitimate that I'm a leg legitimate pastor? He said, yes. I said, do you have any scripture for that? He said, no, I can't point to any specific scripture, but I feel that that's the way it's going to be and you're going to answer at the judgment seat of Christ. And I said, okay, you know, um, this is a little messed up here. But, you know, according to that standard, two people is not a church. Okay. Well, then I guess Paul was not part of the church here at this point in Second. Timothy chapter 4, verses 9 through 11. Because he says there in verse 11, only Luke is with me. Hmm. Only Luke is with me, but Paul's writing to all these different people and saying, hey, send this guy here, send that guy there, say hi to so-and-so and all that. So he didn't have contact, personal face-to-face -face contact with all these brethren, but he's talking to them through letters. Well, I don't have contact with a lot of you out there face to face, but we write to each other. Right now I'm speaking to you, but that's not legitimate. We're not part of the church because we're not meeting face to face. You see how ridiculous that is? And I'll tell you something else that's a big problem. What these guys are trying to do is they say, you know, I've heard this, you know, to these, these church building pastors, they'll say, if you don't have a good Bible believing church in your area, then brother, you need to move to find one. Really? So that's what the Lord wants. Instead of the body of Christ being spread out and doing the work of the Lord, no, let's all just come together and make holy cities. You know, we'll have our own Christian Mecca and our own Christian, you know, Salt Lake City, Utah, or, or the other holy cities, you know, Vatican City. Hey, there you go. You know, <laughs> that's not what the Lord wants. You know what the Lord wants? He wants the body of Christ to be spread out and doing the work. You know, Paul talked about going and building on another man's work, on another, another man's labor, and, and he's like, I don't want to do that. Hey, if you're in some place and you see gospel tracks, you walk into a store and there's a chick track there and there's a fellowship track league there and there's this and there's that. And there's all these gospel tracks laid out. Don't put other tracks on top of them. Say, oh, praise the Lord, some other brother's got this one already. I'll go to another store. You know, that's the way it should be. The body of Christ is supposed to be spread out doing the work of the Lord. But let's consider a couple points here in regards to Hebrews 10 verse 25 being for today. Number one, 
Should King James Bible believing Christians com compromise their beliefs just to attend a local church? Because you see, that's really what's going on right now. You have these Bible believing Christians and they're part of these church buildings and the pastors there are like, you know, well, I don't believe the King James Bible is a perfect word of God. It's just a translation, you know, that it's not accurate to the most reliable Greek text and all that stuff. You know, you have Baptist churches that are using NIVs, Baptist churches that are immodest dress standards and CCM and all the other stuff. Well, brother, you got to be part of a local fellowship, so you just continue going there even though the pastor's not willing to change. Wrong. No. God is not for you compromising the standards of Scripture just so you can attend a local fellowship. Hey, if there are no local fellowships in your area that are worth anything, if they're not standing by the book, get out of them. You say, where am I going to go? Don't go anywhere. Study the Bible on your own. Can't you have a relationship with Jesus Christ on your own apart from some pope up there preaching you, preaching to you and telling you what you're supposed to believe and how you're to make your decisions in life? You know, I get these people all the time and they're like, you know, well, I, I meet with friends and with family, but I guess that's not legitimate. Of course it's legitimate. You know, you are the church. The church is not a building someplace. Get that thing through your head. You don't have to go to some stinking building someplace called a church to be legitimate. And I'm going to be talking about that here in the future coming up. I'm going to talk to you about how a lot of Baptist practice is not based on Scripture. It actually comes from Catholicism. Oh, brother, Baptists aren't part of the Protestant Reformation. Oh, yeah, they are. Oh, yes, they are. Number two, is the fellowship of independent fundamental Baptist buildings really scriptural, or is it worldly social socialization? Okay, they say, oh, you're to assemble yourselves with the brethren. Why? To talk about sports and the weather? No. You see, this thing of assembling yourselves together, most of those buildings are social clubs. Number three, can you really grow as a Christian when both saved and lost are meeting together and the building's main focus is to win souls? Can you really grow a lot as a Christian? Number four, why are we told to follow Paul when he obviously was not a faithful weekly member of a local church? Why follow Paul? Okay, now let's look at what Hebrews 10.25 is really about. Let's look at who it's really written to. All right, we're back here. We just had a little delay there because it was starting to rain a little bit. But uh, prayed about it. The Lord slowed the rain down for us. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. Let's read the actual chapter here so we can get it in context, proper context. You know, the old saying goes, a text without a context is a pretext. That's very true. Hebrews chapter 10. Now, we're not going to read all these verses for sake of time, but you look at verses 1 through 22 there, it's talking about the priest offering multiple sacrifices and stuff, sacrificing of animals, you know, and how that, that doesn't work anymore. That system has been done away because of Jesus Christ. Okay? Verse 19, we'll just read 19 down through 22. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiness, holiest by the blood of Jesus. Okay, not animals anymore, but by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Okay? It's Like I said, it's describing the transition from the Old Testament practice of animal sacrifice to the New Testament practice of Jesus Christ's death being enough. Which, by the way, if you believe in this nonsense teaching that they were saved in the Old Testament by looking forward to the cross, then why were they sacrificing animals? Don't fall for that nonsense. It's totally crazy. Okay, now look at verse 23. Here's where it starts to get interesting. Okay, it's described there the transition from Old Testament to New Testament. Look at verse 23 in Hebrews chapter 10. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Now, 
today as a Christian, do you have to hold fast the profession of your faith without wavering? No. You don't have to hold fast the profession of your faith without wavering to be saved. You don't need to do that. But the Jews will in the time of Jacob's trouble. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. 